just like to welcome um, everyone tonight and sorry for the interrupted start to the evening. But we're on the Tungarong country and I'd just like to acknowledge that we're um, in the Tungarong country and acknowledge the leaders past, present and emerging. Um, today is about getting everybody connected and I know it's not ideal and we all don't love to be in this state but we are so um, what we've decided to do is just do something fun and um, have a wine and dine and have speakers and that's part of a project where we're really looking at um, engaging people in citizen science and um, some of the things that we're looking at is paddock trees um, we're looking at litter, we're looking at um, how, how the creek in Mansfield runs, what sort of birds are around and what sort of mammals are using our nest boxes. So um, this is the start and Ron has been very kindly said he would come and um, join us today, which is great. So thank you to Ron and um, we just hope that you really enjoy the evening. I'll let Ron introduce himself while I download those videos again, Ron. So um, that might take a little bit of time, but Ron can um, fill you in in where he's at. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, Kirsty. Um, I'd like to thank Kim for inviting me along to talk tonight. Um, when Kim spoke to me earlier this month, she um, introduced the concept of a wine and dine with Ron evening. And I thought that sounded jolly civilised. So um, have an evening soiree with wine and food and all that. It's not until the last couple of days that I realised that um, it's you guys who are going to be the whining and dining and I'm not going to be whining and dining at all. So um, it's still civilised, but it's not so jolly. So I can see some of you there eating and um, drinking wine. So good on you. I'll just keep uh, chatting away. Um, for those who don't know me, I see a few familiar faces on the screen here. Um, my name is Ron Litchens, and um, I'm sitting here with Mac the Border Collie, who's totally deaf and half blind. Um, and we're coming live at you from the basement of the Yay Butter Factory, which is where I am tempor temporarily residing at the moment. Um, I guess just to introduce myself, I'm a member of three land care groups in this district. I'm a member of the Strath Creek Land Care Group um, because the location of where this story is set is actually in um, their area. I'm also a member of the Yay River Catchment Land Care Group because uh, where I'm currently living is part of that area. And I'm also a member of the um, Yay Wetlands Committee of Management, which is also uh, a very specialised land care group. So um, I've also done a couple of years at the Euroa Arboretum, um, but I have a couple of confessions to make before we start. The first confession is I'm not a botanist, I'm not a zoologist, I'm not an ornithologist, um, I'm not any of those things. In fact, my background is nuclear physics, which doesn't get much use in central Victoria. Um, so I don't have any qualifications in this stuff, but what I do have is some enthusiasm. So I'm an enthusiastic observer. That, that's, the best that I can, that's the best that I can say. I guess the seven, second confession, which I normally wouldn't make, but which will become immediately apparent, so I'll make it anyway, is um, I'm a nerd. Um, so that's the way it is. Um, if I can actually grab the screen now and let me okay so this is um, this is Ron the nerd at the age of nine um, and if I was to pick any picture of my childhood this would be it I spent my entire time with a butterfly net, a bug catcher, and a little box to collect things. Um, and I had an interest at that time in insects, which was bordering on obsession, I, I would have to say. Uh, soon after this, we moved to Perth, and um, 
I've got to say that the insect obsession left me because the insects over there are few and far between, and the ones that are there are really fast and hard to catch. So um, I lost that obsession, um, but the nerdiness, I guess, never, never left me. So I guess in summary, the presenter tonight um, is an unqualified but enthusiastic nerd. So for better or for worse, that's what you've got. Um, the, 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 the presentation is entitled Life in a Box, and it's all about the power of observation. Um, and if you indulge me a couple of minutes, I'd like to just give you the backstory to how this presentation came about. This is a map of the 2000, uh, 2009 bushfire areas, uh, particularly in Murrindindi Shire, but of course they stretched into Mitchell and then further south into Whittlesea and Nillimbik. Um, early in 2009, my wife and I, for better or for worse, decided we would make a tree change. And um, two weeks before these fires, on the Australia Day long weekend, we loaded up all our worldly goods into two removalist vans and we drove up the hill to a property in Flowerdale, which is signified there by a little red circle near the O in Flowerdale. Um, and then two weeks later, Flowerdale, as we knew it, had disappeared from the map as Black Saturday came through. On the morning of Black Saturday, uh, my wife took first shift on the CFA Flowerdale uh, fire tanker, and I was supposed to take second shift sometime in the afternoon, but as we all know, things really turned to putty, and um, that changeover didn't happen. So I was, I was at the house all day. Her job was to actually stay at the fire station just in case it was a call out. And my job was to move all our worldly possessions, which were still sitting in part on the driveway, so all our furniture and stuff, and move it into the house, um, which I proceeded to do. Um, and we all know what happened on Black Saturday. And the next picture here is, oh, so our house, just to, just to put you in the picture, was a bush block on which sat a former yoga retreat. And it stood at the, um, at the top of a very steep gully, which sloped down to the north. Now, in CFA terms, our house is called, I guess the technical term is kindling, because in the Flowerdale district, all the fires come from the north. And, you know, if you're going to build a house, you wouldn't build it on a steeply sloping um, slope like we had it. So um, that's what it was. So this is a picture taken. So my camera tells me at 10.01 p.m. on Black Saturday, I'm standing on the roof of my house looking south. So as luck would have it, even though most bushfires in Flowerdale come from the north, because of the um, topography, this one came south from the Breaker Day Valley and was proceeding towards me um, up on the other side of that ridge. So what you have there is a picture of a yellow box. And I don't know whether you can see the cursor here, but the ridge line is, is up here. I'm standing on the roof of the house. And there's a whole lot of little wattle trees on the ridge line. And about five minutes after this photo was taken, those wattle trees just exploded, not from not from the fire, but from the heat coming up the side of that ridge. Um, and a couple of hours later, um, oh, so so the the fire crested the ridge, and was blown by the wind towards the house. But because it was blowing down a very steep slope, the forward progression was actually um, slowed down quite a bit. So it was actually burning with the wind, but trying to burn downhill, which, which slowed it up. A couple of hours after this photo was taken, there was a large explosion. And what I can only describe as a log flew from behind that ridge, over the top of that yellow box, over the top of the house, and proceeded to arc down into um, the valley below the house onto the neighbor's pasture land property. And I don't know whether you've ever been in a situation where time slows, but this was one of these situations. And um, I stood there and I watched this burning log um, go tick, tick, tick as it slowly arced across the sky. And I remember thinking, 
geez, I hope it actually goes out before it hits the grass in the valley below, because if it's still a light, then um, all hell's going to break loose. So as I watched it, the, the logs spluttered and then um, went out again and then burst into flames again and, and went out again. And then it eventually hit um, the valley below the house and nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, it was like someone dropped the match into petrol. The whole valley, the fire spread out radially, radially from the impact site and the whole valley was on fire. So now I had a fire coming up the valley towards me, but it was against the wind. So once again, its progress was slowed. Um, and it was sort of like a pincer effect all night. And this is a picture of the house taken at um, 3.30 in the morning looking north. So this is the fire coming up the valley towards the house. Uh, so luckily, um, because of the topography and the wind directions, um, I had enough, and with a mop and a bucket and a lot of adrenaline, I managed to save the house. And, um, and then we started rebuilding our lives again. Now, for the first few months after the fire, um, every time I looked down the valley, I finally realised I wasn't actually seeing what was down there. I was actually reliving the tick, tick, tick as the log arced across the sky. Um, and this was a, a bit of a psychological problem I, I found out I had, but I didn't actually, you know, I kept reliving that moment. And um, one day I was hanging out the washing when the clothesline is, overlooks the valley as well, and something broke me from my reverie. And what I noticed was um, the yellow box, there's a big yellow box in the valley below, but at the base of the yellow box there was a grove of saplings had, had sprung up. And I'd never seen that before. Whenever I'd look down there, I was always reliving that log arcing across the sky. So I noticed this group of saplings. Um, and I thought, that's kind of interesting because I'd never actually seen it before and it had been growing for, at this stage, probably about seven months. And um, so I took my camera and I went down to have a look at this grove of saplings. Now, why did I take my camera? Well, after the fires, one of the programs which was introduced into the King Parrot Creek Valley, which is the Flowerdale Strath Creek community area, was a program to, to a citizen science program to monitor what fauna was coming back into the bushfire affected areas. So landholders, if they wanted to participate, um, were given uh, motion sensing cameras and tape recorders and they could uh, record the life coming back into the valley. 25 properties were involved. And I guess the psychological trick behind this was that if, the, if, you know, if animals are coming back to the valley, then you know, things can't be so bad because Flower Hour was actually psychologically scarred from this, the people were. And I guess the, the fact that animals were coming back meant that you know, thing, things were getting better. So all those observations that we made from the cameras and the tape recordings were actually put on um, a website called Focus on Fauna. And a gentleman by the name of David Wakefield um, once a week wrote a blog which contained all the um, photos that people had taken of the various wildlife um, and a little, little note about the actual animals that were being discussed. And he did that once a week. But so popular was it that um, I was recruited to also write blogs. So um, once a week, Dave would put out a blog and once a week, I would put out a blog. So that was two blogs a week, all about the wildlife in the valley and, and what was happening. Now, after the funding ran out, um, the Strath Creek Landcare Group decided to fund this ourselves. And ever since, we've actually put out two stories a week, up until quite recently, two stories a week about fauna which is happening in the valley. So it's actually quite a bit of pressure to come up with a story every week about something different, um, some animal that's different um, in the valley. So I have my camera with me all at all times and I race down to that group of saplings to see whether um, I could at least get one blog out of um, out of any animals I found sort of on those on those young trees. Um, 
But I'm afraid the inner nerd, which is never too far from the surface, rose again, and my obsession with insects, insects sort of struck again. And it became a, um, a multi-year examination of what actually inhabited that grove of saplings um, with time, with time, I guess. So this is, this, uh, this is called Life in a Box. What box are we talking about? Well, we're talking about uh, a yellow box, a Eucalyptus meliodora. Um, in the uh, the bare hills around Ye and Flowerdale and Strath Creek, it's the it's the king of it's the king of a crop. In the in the low uh, creek beds, you have the red river gums, but on the high um, sparsely soiled slopes, you have the uh, yellow box tree, very tall, very small leaves, sparsely canopy, but quite quite magnificent. So. Um, I'll talk to you about some of the things I saw in these saplings. Now, um, I'm not going to talk to you about everything I've seen because Kim said I have to limit this talk to uh, five hours So, because um, I can talk much longer than that about everything I've seen. So what I've picked are things which um, are fantastical um, but quite common, quite common. So nothing I'm going to talk about tonight is, is rare or endangered. Um, it's a matter of, of looking for them. They're everywhere. In fact, I can walk in the bush now and see them everywhere, um, as you can too. So um, I've divided the, 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 certainly the insects up into their orders, as any good nerd would. Um, so we'll start up with Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths. Now, some of you, you may know or you may not know that um, – Insects are primarily divided into orders based on their wing structure. So, um, lepus is ancient Greek for scale, and tron is ancient Greek for wing. So, the lepidopterans are the scaly winged insects or the butterflies and moths. By far the most common um, insect on the grove of saplings, certainly in the beginning, and you must remember the saplings, and you know very young, very juicy, uh, very flexible leaves, were the cup moths, the Dorotifera species, um, the, the caterpillars. So here's, here this is a um, before spotted cup moth caterpillar, and um, it was in this grove of 12 um, saplings in hundreds. There were hundreds upon hundreds of these caterpillars on there. So as a kid, I remember seeing, you know, lots of these around. As an adult, I haven't seen many at all. But certainly in this grove, there were lots of um, um, four-spotted cup moth caterpillars. This is mum, or, or maybe it's dad. Um, you can see the four spots on the wings there by which it gets its name. I would have probably called it the five-spotted cup moth or maybe the four and a half spotted cup moth but it's called the the four spotted cup moth anyway um now i'm going to use the cursor again if you if you can see this um on this caterpillar here there are four triangles and i'll just circle them here now these are the the the, the defensive mechanisms of the cup moth caterpillar if you um annoy this caterpillar or if it's, if, it's, if it's feeling um, vulnerable, this is what happens. These four areas here explode upwards, so a turret comes out, and out of those turrets come out, um, they look like spines, okay, and, and they sort of look dark red spines. Now, those spines are actually vials of irritant chemical. So if you happen to brush against those spines, you'll break them open, and um, an irritant chemical will come out. Um, some people, some humans actually have quite allergic reactions to um, this chemical, but that's the defense mechanism which this, which this um, caterpillar has. The caterpillar has evolved, this particular species has evolved to have no legs. It, has, it doesn't have any legs. The eyes and the, and the mouth are actually under the body of the caterpillar. So, um, the caterpillar simply eats by just grinding its way along 
a leaf margin, as, as in this picture here. Um, the eggs are laid by, obviously, the, the female uh, moth, but to disguise them, she covers the egg mound in her fur. Um, so what here looks like a small toupee um, sitting on a leaf is actually a um, cup moth caterpillar egg mass covered by cup moth fur. And when the cup moths actually um, hatch, they form, well, I think the collective noun is a flotilla, I'll call it a flotilla, a flotilla of caterpillars which proceed to just scour the, the surface of leaves. Now, there are many species of cup moth caterpillar. The, um, the four spotted cup moth was by far the most prolific, but um, coming a close second was this mottled cup moth caterpillar. And as you can guess by looking at it, there are not only there are not just four turrets, but there are eight turrets, which give you annoy it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and two on the front there, seven, eight. So if it feels annoyed, it once again produces eight turrets with the um, uh, the vials of um, irritant chemicals as spines, and um, it tries to defend itself against predators that way. There was also the, um, I only found one of these in the whole time I was actually examining these saplings, just one of these. This is a pale cup moth caterpillar. And one of these, which is the painted cup moth caterpillar. Another caterpillar, which was quite common, is called the gum leaf skeletonizer. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work, to have a guess at what a gum leaf skeletonizer caterpillar does. It skeletonizes a gum leaf. So like the um, cup moth caterpillars, uh, they hatch and then they proceed to just scour the surface of a gum leaf, both sides. And what they actually leave is a perfectly, um, perfectly formed rib of the leaves with all the veins intact. Um, so if you see those in the bush, they're generally probably due to, to this caterpillar here. The, the biggest caterpillar which um, was inhabited the, um, the grove was the emperor gum moth caterpillar. And once again, as a kid, I remember finding handfuls of these and, um, and collecting them. Um, these days, I hardly see any at all. So this is a, the emperor gum moth. It has, as you can see, it has lots of turrets and lots of spines. But these are just cosmetic only. They serve no function. They have no irritant fluid in it. Um, they're always raised. But I'm guessing that um, um, it has them as a deterrent in case predators think that they're, um, they've got you know, uh, flu uh, irritant fluid and things in it. When the, um, the emperor gum moth actually um, pupates, this is what the pupa looks like. It's actually, if you if you touch it, it feels a bit like fiberglass. It has that plastic feel to it as you, if you if you knock on it. The um, emperor gum moth pupa has the ability to um, sense what the climatic conditions are outside the cocoon, and if it decides that this is not the year for it to come out, it'll just stay in there for another year. How it does that, I don't know, um, but when it does decide to come out. Um, that that cocoon case is fairly hard, so it actually vomits up a fluid which actually softens the cocoon case. And then on the wingtips of the um, fully formed adult are a pair of knives, and it cuts its way out of uh, the cocoon to, um, to become the moth. And those knives drop off after that process, and then you're left with um, the emperor gum moth which is quite a spectacular looking beastie, quite a large beastie. Um, and in close up, it sort of looks like a cat with furry antenna, of course, but um, it's quite beautiful. The other big caterpillar that I found in this grove was the white stemmed gum moth. Um, once again, this um, caterpillar has a defensive system of spines. These spines are ultra sharp, 
And um, if you touch this caterpillar, they pierce the skin without you even knowing it, without you even knowing it, and they become very irritating. So um, for any predator this, who decides to, um, to tackle this caterpillar, it's got to deal with the spines. Now, this caterpillar and the previous ones are prime food for currawongs, and um, I never, ever saw um, either of these caterpillars apart from the, the cocoon one, actually reach maturity. I saw lots of currawongs diving into these saplings to take the caterpillars, but, um, um, yeah, it's a tough life being one of these big, juicy caterpillars. Now, what I have here on the button is I have a, um, a video of um, this caterpillar eating. Now, this is where technology could go a bit astray. Um, we... We think we have a process by which we can actually show this video. Um, we discussed it earlier this week. My plan B was, if it didn't work, was to actually mine. <laughs> mine the, let's let's try it, Rod. Which um, which for the for the, which for the caterpillar one was quite easy, but for the the next video, which is uh, beetles mating, um, is probably politically insensitive not not politically correct for me to do that so um let's try this um so have i done what i needed to do or not yet um just if you can just give me control that's good you're a control freak kirsty i am and caterpillar This may be where technology fails me. I hope it's okay. I might have to get my Here mind ready. I've been practicing all uh, night. Oh, that's okay. We've got it coming <laughs> up now. Damn, I had it. I had this one. I had this one pegged actually. <laughs> Here we go. I've got it. I've just pressed play now. Okay. So hopefully, it, something will come up very shortly. So. If people can hear me, all I've done here is I've just videoed um, this caterpillar eating because it's quite extraordinary the rate at which it actually demolishes leaves. And I think it's probably lucky there was only one caterpillar in the whole grove of 12 because at, at this rate of eating, um, um, it would be it would the whole in a matter of That's the wind from your camera. <laughs> yeah, I know. You can probably turn the... Uh... <laughs> that better? Yeah, that's good. It's a bit jerky, so you can't see it. Anyway, um, I think we'll give that video a 2 out of 10. <laughs> it would have been I think if I had of... Um, Mimed it, I think. All right, so I'll go back. All right? Yep. Sorry about that, folks. It's all yours, run. All righty, here we go. All right, so the next group of um, insects I just want to talk about is um, the coleopterans, the beetles. Um, coleos meaning is ancient Greek for sheath or shield. And once again, Teron, the, um, the ancient Greek for wing. So these are the shield-winged insects. And for anybody who's ever seen beetles fly, they don't actually fly with four wings. They have four wings. The two outer wings, as indicated here, are actually protective covers for the two flying wings underneath. All right. So any insect which ha which has that confirmation of um, wing structure is a beetle. So um, once again, by far the most prolific of the beetles were what, what are called the chrysomelid beetles or the tortoise beetles. These come in a um, a range of different shapes and sizes and colours. 
Um, the colours can be misleading. So I could definitely um, identify the northern eucalyptus beetle and the golden eucalyptus beetle, but that's as far as it goes. And to actually identify them um, correctly, you really need to look at their genitalia, which is something I neither have the, um, the time to do nor the interest to tell you the truth. But nonetheless, um, these are not the type of beetles, if you're a tree grower, like if you're a plantation tree grower, that you want to actually see around the place. They're actually quite, um, they're actually quite stunning, but they do um, play havoc with leaves. So these are the egg cases of um, a tortoise beetle. These are the caterpillars of a tortoise beetle. And these half moon shapes on the on the um, on the rim of the gum leaf are characteristic, are characteristic that you actually have eucalyptus beetles um, in your trees. So these are the um, the shapes that the adults actually make when they eat the gum leaves. So it's not just the larva that eat the gum leaves; it's the adults as well. Now, as far as I can see, the only thing that eucalypt adult eucalyptus beetles do is eat and mate. Um, and sometimes they do at the same time. In fact, a lot of the times they do it at the same time. And I have another video here that shows this. Now, I, I really had this one down pat as a mine, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you probably want to show this as a, um, as a video. So let me uh, let you in. Yep, I'm ready to go. All kids, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you should be in bed. <laughs> I'm getting my mind ready. Is it coming up, Kirsty? Here we go. So here we have here is a video of um, a male and female chrysomelid beetle mating. Um, the female seems quite happy to eat as the process happens. Um, in fact, the male's got to hang on for grim death because sometimes his feet leave the leaf and he's just he's just hanging there. But you can see this is the this is the shape that. Um, uh, that gets left in the leaf margin if you have adult uh, gum leaf beetles um, in your trees. So very often you can actually tell what insect is there, even if you can't see them, by the damage that, that's made to the leaf. And if you've got perfect half moons in the leaf margin, it's a sure sign you have um, uh, tortoise beetles. All right, I'm going back in. Sorry, Ron, I got to um, watch that twice. So um, sorry to everyone out there. <laughs> I enjoyed that twice. <laughs> There's a name for people like you. Right, um, so... The other beetles are obviously scarab beetles. This, once again, as a kid, I remember picking up Christmas scarabs um, by the handful, and I just haven't seen them around lately, but they were certainly in the trees. Uh, nectar scarabs as well. Nectar scarabs sort of would um, 
chew off the very fine shoots that grow at the stem margins. Um, so they actually can do quite a bit of damage if they're out of control in terms of numbers. Um, in this plantation, they weren't, but it was easy to see what damage they could have done. Um, so this is a Christmas scarab, and this is the type of damage an adult Christmas scarab does. They're shredders, they're leaf shredders. So if you see leaves which look like this, like someone's taken to them with a chainsaw, um, a sure sign that you have um, scarab beetles in your area. The other things, the other beetles which were um, quite common are eucalyptus weevils. And um, they look kind of cute, they look kind of shy. Um, and whenever you see them, they, they look like they're hanging on for grim death. They got all their six legs sort of wrapped around the, um, the stems as if, um, as if they're going to fall off. In fact, their defence mechanism is if you get too close, they'll just drop off onto the ground. So to get a picture is actually quite hard. Um, as they get older, um, they get browner. So the one, the beetle on the left there is actually quite an old beastie. I don't know how old that would be, but uh, quite mature. The one on the top right there is, 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 is a young one. Now, these are my favourites. Okay, this is um, the hemipterans, right? Hemi is um, ancient Greek for half. So these are the half-winged insects, and they're characterised by the fact that they've only got half a wing, right? It doesn't cover their whole body. But more importantly, they're, they're, these are the sap-sucking insects. All right, so they have sucking mouth parts. Um, so you will know them in your veggie garden as the scourge of veggie gardens because they sort of destroy your tomatoes and other plants. Um, and cicadas are hemipterans. But um, these are really interesting. And one of the interesting things about this order of insects is that unlike the butterflies and the beetles, which we've seen, which have four life cycle stages, that's the egg, going to a, uh, a caterpillar or a grub, going to a pupa, going to the adult. Hemipterans only have three life cycle stages. So they have an egg which hatches into something called an instar, which sort of looks like a small adult. And then as the instar grows, it simply molts and grows into a bigger instar, which grows into a bigger instar, which eventually turns into a winged adult. So they have a different um, life cycle. Uh, so, very common, and these are common everywhere, not just in my yellow box grove, but um, you can, in spring and summer, these will be on every eucalypt tree you can possibly find. Um, these are gum tree hoppers. Now, these are true sap suckers. Now, like most hemipterans, um, they're sucking the sap to get the protein out of the sap. That's what they actually use as food. But um, eucalyptus leaves, particularly young ones, are very high in sugar. So to get enough protein, they've got to suck quite a bit of sap. And the byproduct of that process is these insects extrude sugar out of their bums, I guess, to be polite, um, which means that any self-respecting ant um, that has gum tree hoppers in the vicinity will actually look after the gum tree hoppers. So in, you know, in exchange for uh, pure sugar, which comes out of the back end of the gum tree hopper, the ants provide protection against predators and parasites. <clears throat> so the picture on the um, left there, which I was lucky to get, is an ant which is close enough just to take that bubble of sugar from the back of a gum tree hopper um, so it could take it back to its hive. And you can see on the leaf below, it's... Um, there's a there's a drop of the sugar as well, and that's what you know. These things just are sugar producing machines. So you'll generally find um, gum tree hoppers in close attendance with ants, and in some species, the ants will actually herd them down into the ant nest overnight to protect them, and in the morning just bring them back up the tree again so they continue so they can continue sucking sap and producing sugar for the ants. Now, once again, these come in all ranges of um, colours and sizes. They're commonly black and white, but they can have red markings, they can have orange markings. They're, you can have gold ones and brown ones, as shown by the, the, the bottom right picture. Now, this scene here looks like a battle scene from Lord of the Rings, but just to explain what 
it actually is. Um, the adult gum tree hoppers are the black things with the brown heads. The instar gum tree hoppers, the young ones, are the black things with the red tails and the brown heads. So they've got no wings. And they're being tended by sugar ants. And if you go to different trees, you'll have different species of gum tree hopper with different species of ants looking after them. And most of them, as I say, will at night herd the gum tree hoppers to a space, a safe space on the ground, and in the in the during the day bring them back up again, and um, they will uh, tend the gum tree hoppers while they're producing sugar. So um, the reason, so these are gum tree hopper instars or nymphs, and the reason why I've got this picture is you can actually see there's a a little bubble of sugar there um, coming out the back of one of those those instars. But if you get an infestation of these nymphs, um, what you can see is that sometimes the stems of trees are just coated and dripping with sugar. And you'll get lazy honeybees who, instead of racing around to flowers um, to pick up pollen, will simply go to these sources of um, pure sugar and just lap up the sugar instead. The other um, sap suckers which um, were on the grove um, and very, very plentiful. And once again, this is a very, very common hemipteran all throughout the landscape, uh, certainly in Victoria, is something called a psyllid. Now, you may not have heard of this insect, but um, they're extremely common. Now, this is a picture of an adult female psyllid who has just laid a series of eggs. Now, that, to scale, that, that insect is about three millimetres long, all right? So they're very, very, very small. Um, and it's there at, at the moment. Is the, that picture is of its sucking sap, but you can see the egg cases, and this is a lace psyllid. Um, so psyllids also produce sugar. So this is a psyllid nymph. So one, two, here. Um, and they have uh, evolved to actually, when they extrude the sugar, they extrude it into a shape which makes a house for them to live in, for protection. All right. So those houses are called lerps. All right. So you can see there are various types of psyllids, and the psyllids are actually described by the house that their nymphs make. So this is called a sugar psyllid up in the top left-hand side there. The houses that um, the nymphs make are, are round conical structures. Um, and under that, the psyllid is actually sitting. This is uh, called a lace lerp, which actually produces a house which sort of looks like a scallop. And this is called a white clam lerp. Um, and it produces a house which looks like a white clam shell. And you can, you can just see there's the psyllids under there. Okay, so the psyllid actually sits under there sucking sap um, for its life and, um, and producing a house by which it, it, it can protect itself. Now, obviously, these houses are made of um, a mixture of sugar and, um, and, and wax, and... Um, and obviously ants will come along, as will a lot of other creatures will come along, and they will eat the, the house or the lerp because it's a ready supply of sugar. So, for example, so, I mean, before I go on, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here where the psyllid has been sucking the sap, the leaf dies, and the psyllid will have to move on to another source of sap. So um, for those who have driven along the Golden Valley Highway from Yay to Seymour in the past couple of years, you'll notice that all the gum trees are brown. And that's because there's been an infestation of psyllids um, and the, the, um, the larva actually sucking the sap out. It won't kill the tree, but it will still only stunt its growth for a season until the, the balance of, um, of psyllids is, is readdressed. So... Um, Ants obviously like um, the sugar supply from, from lerps and will sort of take a grain of sugar out of each lerp. But in particular, birds like partilotes and bell miners 
actually feed exclusively on, on the lerp, on the house itself. So in fact, the pardalite has a groove in its beak, which is designed so it can actually pick off the lerp without damaging the um, psyllid that's living underneath it. So the psyllid's sitting there sucking away, reading a book or watching telly or something, and all of a sudden a pardalote comes along and takes the house away, right? And the psyllid looks up and goes, where's my house gone? And then proceeds to build another house. And when you think about it, the pardalotes are actually farming these things, right? They're, um, they're not killing the, 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 the nymph, but they're just taking the house and allowing the nymph to be there and rebuild another house. So it's sort of like a, it's probably not a symbiotic relationship, but it's certainly a relationship of some sort there. And part loads in particular, this is their food source. So um, if you visit any gum tree during spring or summer, whether it's a mature leaf or a nice juicy leaf, you'll find these. It's just a matter of knowing what to look for. Um, gum tree scale, it's, uh, the scale insect is another insect which sucks sap. Um, the young nymphs of a, of a scale insect actually build a wax cocoon, as you can see there, which they live in. Um, in the final, uh, so when they molt, they leave that cocoon, move to another spot on the branch and build a bigger cocoon. And that process continues. Um, until the final molt where the, um, the male comes out and he's got wings, the female does not have wings, and the female adult takes about two weeks to build her final cocoon. And in that time, before she can get the cocoon up, the male mates with her, and um, she'll spend the rest of her life just attached to the tree with her bum sticking out of the hole of that cocoon and exuding sugar. So you can actually see, I think, well, I can see it on my screen. You might be able to see it. There's droplets of sugar coming out of these holes here. And that's just simply, once again, it's the insect, whether it's adult or larva, uh, sucking sap, extruding sugar, and once again, tended by ants. Um, gum tree bugs are also uh, hemipterans, are sap suckers. Now, if you've got young um gum tr gum trees or gum leaves and the um the tips are all wilted as you can see here that is due to and it shouldn't surprise you the eucalyptus tip wilter bug right so once again they're sap suckers both the adults and the young um the picture on the right there is of two instars, but there are different instars. So as the instars actually grow and molt, they come back as a different shape and a different colour. Um, actually quite colourful. So um, the one on the top here I think is instar number two. I think this one's instar number five. And you can see the wing buds are being developed. So it's getting closer and closer to being an adult. These are what the adults look like, quite drab. This is dad over here, this is mum over here, and you can tell the difference. The difference is chunky thighs. Dad's got chunky thighs, mum hasn't got chunky thighs, all right? So for such colourful instars, it's sort of a shame that the parents turn out to be so drab, but, you know, like, oops, what have I done there? You're right, uh, Ron, we're just on adult uh, mum and dad okay yep okay so um can you see the screen again so um so mum and dad um i guess humans turn i'll go that too so sometimes as well colorful kids but man um so i've, I've called this section here the second wave um what you've seen up until now is i guess the initial inhabitants of the grove. Um, these are things which actually eat, eat the young, juicy leaves. The second wave, um, I, call, I call it the second wave, is the, is the insects that come in and eat the young, juicy primary wave insects. So the first one I have here is, is a scorpion fly, which is neither a scorpion nor a fly. Um, um, 
but it's it's sometimes called a hang fly. It's got long legs. It just sort of hangs on leaves. And this one I uh, photographed, and it was actually picking off those black things, which are um, eucalyptus beetle larvae, and it's just hanging there and just eating them off one at a time. It's tough. It's a pretty brutal life out there. <clears throat> this is a hemipteran. It's um, it's not a um, it's not a sap sucker, but it sucks the blood of sap suckers, if you know what I mean. So it'll go after gum tree hoppers. It'll go after um, some of the other sap sucking insects and suck them. Uh, Pardalote, like we've already talked about. The pardalotes come in and um, they uh, they eat the lerp, which develop um, with the cellars develop. And by probably by year seven, or maybe it was year six, the saplings were getting big enough and strong enough to support small birds nesting in them. So um, this is the nest of a striated pardalote. The nest is one of these nests which sort of hangs in the branches. It's fully enclosed. Um, but to trick other birds who actually feast on um, uh, thornbill chicks, the top of the nest, and if I had to realise this at the time, I would have taken a picture of it, but the top of the nest has got a depression in it to make it look like it's the nest is actually on the top um, but empty. Now, once again, I have a video here um, of the striata pardalote. And Kirsty, can you stop it at 47 seconds? Do you reckon you can do that? I will try my dandest. How about that? Excellent. I just want to show you something. So this is just a picture of uh, a, a video of um, striata pardalotes feeding. Is that okay, Ron? Um, no. Your timing is different to my timing. What how, What was it? 46, was it? 47. Okay, I've got five more seconds. Ah. <laughs> Did I do that right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly 47 here. <laughs> I'll have to mime it. <laughs> okay. And um, we've got a few clarifications run while I stop sharing. Uh, yep. Is it a striated thornbill or a striated pardalote? Oh, sorry, striated thornbill. What did I say, pardalote, did I? Yeah, that's okay. You had uh, a pardalote picture as well. So, yeah. Uh, Jeff, is that you correcting me? Y yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. Jeff yeah. Leslie, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and he's, we're at half past seven. Group. <laughs> Sorry about you know, straight at Thornbill. What I wanted yes. to show you there was um, the, the straight at Thornbill actually feeds the chicks, but it's, it's a totally enclosed nest, right? So if uh, for birds who have an open nest, um, the young just hang off the side and, you know, they squirt their feces over the edge. But for birds which have an enclosed nest, the young actually put their feces into a, a gelatin package. And so um, I worked out after every five feedings, the adult reaches in and takes out what looks like a mothball, but it's actually a gelatin package, which is the feces of the young. So you missed that. I could try and, try and mime it, but I don't think I will. All right, let's, let's move on. <clears throat> So, Ron, we're just at half past seven, just a bit yep. after, just yep. letting you know. Okay. And um, 
we've got a question about the type of camera. How did you get the pictures? So beautiful pictures. OK. Um, well, for, for us, we did start late, so I've, I've got a couple more slides. But to, but to answer that question, um, it's quite interesting because um, because I've got to take a picture of a, a piece of fauna every week, and I don't know what that will be. I need a camera which is all purpose. And because I usually do it from a bicycle, it needs to be fairly lightweight and robust. So um, Nikon have a, a, a class of cameras called uh, super zoom cameras. So um, the camera I use is called the Nikon Coolpix P900. Um, and in one lens, it goes from 24 millimeter, which is macro, up to 2000 millimeter telephoto. So I could take the picture of, on, of the feather outside a bird's bum from six kilometers away, um, or I could take the picture of an eyeball of a fly, all using just one camera with the one lens. So Coolpix P900. They've now got another, uh, um, that's been superseded by the Coolpix P, I think it's called 1000, which goes up to a 3000 millimeter focal length lens, telephoto lens. Um, so that's the camera I use. Um, right, so just quickly, this is normally where my presentation stops, but I realise that if if the people in your in your citizen science group are actually looking at trees, they're probably not looking at, at just young trees, they're probably looking at mature trees as well. And all you've seen here are things that eat leaves, all right? Now, the trees that uh, I've been looking at um, – Never got to I never got to see them flower because um, by the time they were flowering, they were too high for me to to um, <clears throat> take pictures of. Um, so in the A wetlands last year, a swamp gum came down, and its flowering branches were at ron ron height, which is a pretty dangerous thing. So just to show you what can happen, you know, if you start to talk about flowering trees then the whole landscape of the number of animals and things which actually come in is just, you know, just explodes. So just quickly, um, so, you know, you then have the pollinators. So if anybody's done the Citizen Science Project called um, Wild Pollinator Count, you know it's just, just it's not just, you know, honeybees and native bees which are pollinators, ants are pollinators. Um, and these are all in the swamp gum in the wetlands, right? So the big scarabs will come in, the fiddler beetles, the jewel beetles. Um, the pintail beetles. So beetles have become pollinators. Um, and the Yavaru Catchment Landcare Group have just commissioned me to do a talk on wasps. And I found out in doing that that all adult wasps are nectar feeders, right? So wasps are pollinators as well. So this is a yellow hairy flower wasp that was in the um, swamp gum. This is a Ichneumon wasp. If you don't think aliens are inhabiting Earth, take a look at this one. This is called a Dastra a Gastrupid wasp. Um, and these predate on um, blue banded bee nests. But my favourite insect of all, and I've left it till last, so this is the very last insect I'll bore you about, but it's my favourite, are called the flower wasps. All right, now this is a black flower wasp. Now, the flower wasp is a species of insect that have sexual dimorphism, which means the male is much bigger than the female. In fact, the male is winged and the female is not. The female lives on the ground, but the male has wings and sort of flies around. Um, but once again, they're all nectar feeders. So when the female wants to actually feed, it's on the ground. It can either climb up the tree or it could do something far more tricky. And what it does, it climbs up a blade of grass and puts out a pheromone saying, hey, guys, I want a mate, right? So the nearest male comes by and mates with the female. And um, during that mating process, the male will get bored and just fly off. But the female will hang on, right? So the male will fly off to feed and the female will hang on and will also feed at the same time. And when she's had enough food, she'll just drop off and go underground again. So this picture here is of a male winged um, flower wasp. And hanging onto the back end is the female non-winged flower wasp who um, just hangs on for the food, basically. 
So that's all I have to talk. I was only given an hour, um, so that's it. Um, all these stories and more are on Focus on Fauna. Uh, unfortunately, one of the authors, Dave Wakefield, passed away earlier this month. So at the moment, it's just me um, writing the articles. So probably only one a week or maybe even less at the moment. Um, these stories are also on um, our two land care groups. And on my Facebook page, for those who are interested, I simply put up every two, three or four days a picture like what you've seen there. So no pictures of my food, no discussion about where I've eaten or a picture of my left nipple or you know family shots. It's just straight nature shots. So um, what I encourage people to do is if you're taking pictures of trees and you're so inclined, have a closer look because there's a whole world you know, sort of in there, in the leaves, in the flowers, um, which is worth taking pictures of as well. So thank you. I've got to fly. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you so much, Ron. I I know I was smiling and laughing through it, um, not because I'm the only one on camera, but um, because it was very entertaining and um, insightful. And I've often wondered why the shapes on trees have certain things and now I know um, so it was just great now if anybody would like to ask Ron a question we're happy to keep it going for a bit longer we understand that we've run over a little bit and you might be having your tea um, waiting for you and that's fine as well but if you'd like to turn on your um, video and your microphone and ask Ron a question um, we'd be really open to that too I'll stop recording about now so that um, people don't feel bad uh, yeah, asking a question. And Ron, just while we're waiting for people to uh, do that, we've just had lots and lots and lots of people say thank you 